An obvious place to start our discussion of executive presence is to define it so that we know exactly what we're talking about. But even before that, it's important we do something else first. If you took my free Proficiency One course, 10 Tips for Improving Your Analytic Writing, you hopefully remember my point about making sure you always put your bottom line up front so that your reader doesn't have to wait for your key findings. Well, I'm going to follow my own advice here and put a critical bottom line about executive presence right at the beginning of this seminar. I'm confident this bottom line is not what you're expecting, but it also shouldn't be news to you. If it is, then you've led a charmed life up until now, and I'm sorry to have to wake you from your pleasant dream. My bottom line related to executive presence is this. Life is not fair. Almost nothing that we're going to talk about in this course is fair. Everything about executive presence relates to your being judged by other people on factors that might have little to do with your ability to actually perform your job. Is such judgment always fair? Absolutely not. For example, the length of someone's time probably has no relevance to job performance, but I will judge men in a formal workplace negatively if their tie ends three inches short of their belt. That's just stupid, but I do it. Is it fair that the rules covering executive presence are unclear or hidden, and that no one besides me will spend much time explaining them to you? Or that when you break these rules, you'll really know because feedback in this area is almost non-existent? Or that these rules change from company to company, job to job, or person to person? Nope, none of that is fair. Should unconscious bias play such a significant role in executive presence, to the point where I'm often not aware I'm even judging someone, let alone understand what that judgment is? And speaking of biases, should women and people of color have to deal with so many additional challenges? Of course not. And finally, it certainly is not fair that the rules of executive presence historically have been written by and for this guy. Yep. I'm a white male in his mid-fifties with white hair, a beard, and a deep voice who happens to also be six feet tall. People like me wrote the rules for people like me, and in the professional settings I come from, the majority of people's unconscious biases always break my way, which gives me a significant advantage when others meet me for the first time. I have the privilege of getting the benefit of the doubt about my competence from people who meet me for the first time based on nothing more than my appearance. That certainly is not fair. This situation is slowly changing, and individuals, companies, and society in general are coming to grips with the role that conscious and unconscious biases play in how we judge the competence of others. But we have a long way to go. I am still the completely unfair standard that many people unconsciously use when assessing others professionally, except for maybe in the tech world where, let's face it, I come across as a little too old. It's tempting to reject the entire concept of presence since it's so unfair. But as I'll argue throughout this course, that could be a grave mistake for you professionally. Instead, I urge you to accept that this topic is not fair and work with me to make it ultimately work for you. As I promised in the intro video, I'm going to be honest with you and focus on how things actually are, unfairness and all. You need to have an accurate picture of reality so that you can navigate it and so that as you attain positions of great authority, you can work to change it to be a bit fairer. That would be a wonderful side effect of this course. So let's get back to the question of what exactly executive presence is. The best overview of the various elements of executive presence I found is in Sylvia Ann Hewlett's book, Executive Presence, The Missing Link Between Merit and Success, and several supporting studies by the Center for Talent Innovation that Hewlett directed and used as the basis for her book. I've read a lot of other work on the topic since then, but this remains my favorite. By the way, there's a downloadable reading list at the end of this course that contains my favorite sources on executive presence. Going back to Hewlett, her team interviewed 4,000 professionals around the world to get at what exactly makes up executive presence. This research suggests there are three universal pillars. The first is gravitas, which is where we're going to spend a lot of time on in this course because it's so important, but also because it's a quality we talk about but rarely seek to explain or define. The second pillar is communication. This is a much more familiar and tangible concept than gravitas, so I won't spend as much time on it. Your ability to communicate with others is obviously a critical professional skill and a key life skill in general. Much of the leadership training I do focuses on building communication skills, and I'm going to draw from that material here. The final pillar is one that tends to generate the most discussion when talking about executive presence, and that's your appearance. As we'll see, it can be the most or least important part of your executive presence, depending on the situation. 
It's also where much of the unfairness of executive presence comes to a head. I'll be using these three pillars to provide a broad structure for much of this course, though as you'll see, these traits interact and overlap in a variety of ways. Before we move on, I'm going to do something a bit odd and question the appropriateness of the very term we're using here, executive presence. To me, it implies that this presence thing is important primarily for executives or other senior professionals and that you only need to worry about this later in your career. That could not be farther from the truth. Your presence will be judged the moment you walk in the door to a new job. In fact, as we'll talk about later, the judging is going to begin before you even walk through the door, as how you present yourself during the interview process will have a huge influence on whether or not you're even hired. Given this, it's misleading to use the word executive, so I'm going to suggest we try something else. I like the term professional presence because it relates to the importance of the concept to your professionalism in general and not to just qualities associated with executives. No matter where you are in your organization's hierarchy, how you present yourself matters, whether you're the intern, the newest employee, or the CEO. I'll use these terms, executive presence, professional presence, and presence interchangeably throughout the course, but now you know my intent behind the term. With that out of the way, I can now offer you my definition of professional presence. Your professional presence consciously and unconsciously communicates your competence. It's how your professionalism comes across when you are focused on projecting an image of the best you, such as during an interview or a briefing. But it's also when you're just walking down the hall or talking to someone at lunch. If presence were only relevant when you knowingly step into the spotlight, managing it wouldn't be that hard. In reality, the spotlight extends to times when you don't realize anyone is paying attention to you. One goal of this course is to make you more conscious of all the instances when your presence is under scrutiny, without making you overly paranoid, of course. More generally, I want to shift more of your presence that you exude from the unconscious to the conscious column, so that you can be more aware and take greater control of how you are communicating your competence to others. In the communication course I teach, becoming a purposeful communicator is a common theme, and that idea of being purposeful is equally relevant to your professional presence. The more purposeful you are in what you're communicating and how you're doing it, the better chances are that others will see you in the way that you want them to. And now that I've told you what I think executive presence is, I want to talk a little bit about what presence isn't. I think it's critical to note at the outset that in almost all professional settings, strong executive presence is never a substitute for expertise and actual competence. Most professional cultures equate expertise with credibility, and being confident and a smooth talker is not a path to success in the long run. The one career that is a clear exception to this rule might be politics, where you can go far with nothing more than the ability to spit out the proper sound bite at the right time. Most of us do not live in the world of Catch Me If You Can, a movie where Leonardo DiCaprio plays the role of Frank Abagnale, who successfully posed as an airline pilot, doctor, and prosecutor, among other things, without having any of the underlying skills necessary for those jobs. Instead, his confidence, appearance, and communication skills presented a powerful professional presence that convinced people of his bona fides. I urge you not to try a similar tactic in your workplace. You will eventually be found out. As a result, your initial focus should always be on developing the basics of your tradecraft, whatever that may be, along with building any necessary substantive knowledge and organizational acumen. If you fail in those areas, no amount of presence will save you. As Hewlett notes in her book to stress the primacy of expertise, if you cannot command a subject, you certainly cannot command a room. Occasionally someone can project enough confidence to convince others of an underlying competence that actually isn't there. But such instances where strong presence substitutes for competence are short-lived. As Thomas Chamorro Premusic notes in his book, Confidence, Overcoming Low Self-Esteem, Insecurity, and Self-Doubt, in the short term, it's hard to get a sense of how competent people actually are, but in the long term, quote, it's quite easy to discern between confidence and competence. You just look for the signals of actual talent and disregard confidence as just noise, end quote. Again, I urge you to focus on the competence part, and at Proficiency One, we'll have other courses to help you there. But as you work on that, don't neglect the presence that will help communicate that competence to others. In our next section, I'll talk about why I think you should care about your presence. I'll cover the link between presence and perception, how presence affects you professionally, who is assessing your presence, 
and when and how they are doing it. 